In 1960, the USSR began building nuclear-powered submarines with cruise missiles, Project 675 submarines. This was a continuation of Project 659, a series of submarines armed with ship-to-ship -ship cruise missiles. But before I get to the video, I want to recommend you my new channel Vision or Crime, where I tell about interesting and criminal stories and mysterious disappearances, shocking crimes in the USA and Europe. I am sure you will not be bored. Follow the link that appeared in the upper right corner. Also, the link to the channel I placed in the description to this video. So, let's continue. Project 675 submarines differed from their predecessors in having a diesel generator, slightly larger dimensions, but a lower surface speed, and armament the caliber of torpedo tubes was larger and the number of torpedoes also increased. Instead of cruise missiles B-5 were used more advanced P-6, which had a longer range, 650 km versus 500 km, and higher speed, 1,650 km per hour versus 1,250 km per hour. A total of 29 submarines were built under Project 675 in 1960 to 1968. They served in the Northern and Pacific fleets, some were involved in combat duty in the Indian Ocean. In the evening of June 13, 1973 at one of the ranges of the Sea of Japan was an experimental firing of missiles from the submarine K-56, cruiser Vladivostok and missile ship Uporni. The crew of the submarine did a great job, all the rockets hit their target. In high spirits the sailors returned to the base where the command staff was waiting for them. In addition to the crew, on board the submarine were the officers of the other boat, K-23, and adjusters from Leningrad. Around 9 p.m. everyone present gathered in the wardroom and drank tea. Then two captains stayed to play backgammon, while most went to bed. The battery room was occupied by 36 people, twice as many as it should have been. About 20 more slept in the forward torpedo room. On June 14, at 1 a.m., the submarine was rounding Cape Pavarotny in the Primorsky Cry. It was still about four hours to reach the base. At the same time, the research vessel Academic Berg was passing nearby. The Vladivostok, which accompanied the submarine, noticed the ship and passed the information about it to K-56. But the radar station, which would have shown where the ship was, was switched off on the boat. After rounding the cape, the submarine suddenly found itself in a band of dense fog. When the academic berg suddenly dived toward the K-56, the submarine commander gave the order, full astern, but it was too late. The academic berg rammed the submarine, literally ripping the hull between the first and second compartments with its bow. Water immediately rushed into the hole. Immediately after the strike the captain of the first rank Lenislav Suchkov jumped out of his cabin and ordered over the speakerphone, there is a hole in the second compartment. Close the bulkheads. Start fighting for ship's survivability. This command was the last entry in the watch log of the central post. There were 49 people in the first and second compartments. The compartments had to be isolated with the remaining crew in them. A few people still managed to break through to the other compartment, but water started coming in through the passageway there as well. Leonid Shenikny, commander of the 5th Combat Unit of K-56, rushed to the door of the manhole. He closed the manhole and covered the swivel mechanism with himself so that no one could open it. He died that way, hanging on the door, not letting go of the steering wheel, recalled Lukyan Fedchik, the navigator who miraculously survived he had left the second compartment half an hour before the collision. The sailors in the second compartment died within a couple of minutes. On the lower deck of the second compartment there were huge accumulators that got into the water and started a chemical reaction with an abundant release of chlorine. The sailors had no chance of survival. The boat commander and other officers were talking to them on the intercom. The captain and other officers were talking to them on the intercom, reassuring them that the boat was coming ashore and that they would be rescued soon, but they realized they wouldn't make it, Fedchik recounted. Meanwhile, the first compartment began to flood. There were 22 people in it, mostly members of the K-23 crew. The compartment had only seven breathing apparatuses, each bearing the names of the K-56 crew, which meant death for 15 of the other crew, the oldest of whom, Lt. Alexander Kucheryakov, was only 25 years old. The hole could not be repaired and the water could not be pumped out. 
the crew moved to the deck above. The water started coming in even faster through the pump's drain valve, which was left open. Seaman Stepan Kazani managed to close it, to do so, in complete darkness, he swam through two flooded hatches. By that time the water had risen so high that the men who had climbed onto their bunks were standing up to their chests in the freezing water. The ceiling was only one and a half meters from their bunks. The compartment was running out of oxygen. Kutcher Yavi was already ready to try to save the crew by getting out of the boat through the escape hatch. The chances of survival were slim, but they would have been zero if the compartment had been flooded. At that moment the ship's commands rang out over the ship's comm system, attention. Prepare for ground impact. The navigator managed to find a shoal and lead the boat to it. She landed so softly on the shoal that the survivors hardly felt it. In the meantime, help was waiting for the boat, a tugboat, a rescue boat, and a nearby torpedo boat. After rescuing the survivors, the divers began to retrieve the corpses. But they soon jumped out of the flooded second compartment shouting, they're alive in there, they're moving. Of course, they weren't. The sailors' bodies were upright in the water, and as soon as they were touched they began to move, moving their arms. Their postures and faces were unnatural and distorted with grimaces of horror. The divers were not psychologically prepared for such a picture. When the rescue work to retrieve the bodies of the dead began, the rescue sailors were poured a hundred grams of alcohol before each go around. But even this did not always help, the picture in the compartment was terrible. Some of the sailors died in their sleep after being gassed. Some even had a smile on their face evidently they were dreaming about something good, Fedchik recollected. The next morning, cement was used to plug the hole in K-56, flooded compartments were drained, pontoons were attached to the boat and it was towed to a dock in Chasma Bay, where the hole was temporarily sealed and then shipped off for repairs to the coastal town of Bolshoi Cayman. Six months later, on February 19, 1974, submarine K-56 started sea trials. That academic bird got off with a minor scratch. The captain blamed the incident on his assistant, who had arbitrarily altered the ship's course without informing the command. Finding herself in an area with poor visibility, that academic bird did not give fog signals. According to results of the investigation the cause of the tragedy was considered non-fulfillment of the international rules of preventing collisions at sea, which also applies to surface submarines, switching off the K-56 radar at night in fog, poor watchkeeping, carelessness of the crews. In the situation that night the submarine was supposed to let the academic berg ahead and wait until it moved away to a safe distance, and the academic berg, in turn, when it saw that it was not doing so, was supposed to stop moving and give a warning with its lights. Neither of these things happened. The charges against the 27 dead sailors were dropped. They were buried as heroes. I thank you for watching. Your support is very important to me. Your comments and thumbs up motivate me to release new videos on interesting topics. Subscribe and turn on notifications. See you in the new videos.